Okay, so uh, picking up from the top once more, uh, roadmaps do change. In short, we'll be talking about some roadmap um, items related to PowerStore. So some functionality that is extremely important that uh, either is available or will be in the next few months. So just know that uh, roadmaps do change and we'll keep going through the content as uh, you guys have more questions. So we went through the, um, very quickly through the first pillar, which is data centric. And I think from a, from a requirements standpoint, when you, when any customer is looking at any, you know, storage appliance in order to house their workloads, whether it be considered enterprise level or mid range, they're looking for, you know, ease of use, right. And being able to leverage those applications and in the least amount of hardware possible and giving them that flexibility to scale up and scale out. So from a power store and Dell Technologies perspective, we are committing to quite a few things. So what do we mean when we say performance optimized? With power store, not only can we scale up, but we can scale out in a federated fashion. We have a slide that I love to go over that will go into the next, uh, the next few minutes, and I'll show you how that architecture was put into place and why it makes sense, um, along with some end-to-end -end NVMe functionality. And then efficiency without compromise. You know, why are we able to stand behind these numbers and with always on inline data reduction? All technical aspects of PowerStore. So with any workload, and as you can see here, the flexibility of protocols that we support and the flexibility of workloads that we support really tell the story of PowerStore and what we are actually aiming for. So whether your data center is running applications and databases, we support vVols, we support block volumes, and we support uh, file, um, file workloads as well as containers inside of this appliance. Now, from the uh, image that you're seeing there on the bottom, this is a, a representation of what a single 2U appliance looks like with a fully populated um, BAE, which has all either all NVMe SSD or all NVMe SCM um, on the base enclosure. Um, okay, so as we dig deeper into the technical details of PowerStore, um, one of the key factors here that you'll see is simplification of naming convention for it is, is a big thing for us from a messaging perspective. But also I'd like to say that from one appliance to another, whether it's the 1,000 or the 9,000 at, at the very right, you have capacities, max number of drives, drive types, and modules that are supported regardless of which, mod, of which model you end up purchasing, right? Which I, I think tells a very simplistic story from a Dell Technologies perspective. As you move from one appliance to another in the decision-making process, you'll see that um, one of the key differentiators are the numbers of cores and the speed of the processors, right? And as well as the memory per appliance that is supported. Okay, so in, in this view, this is a rear view of a 2U appliance or what we call a, um, it, so terminology has changed quite a bit for us with PowerStore in the past. You would call a node a controller, you would call an appliance an array, right? So, and what you're looking at here is that you have node A at the bottom and node B at the top. The bottom node is essentially your, your controller and a controller on the top, control, controller on the bottom with duplicate sets of hardware from a connectivity perspective and from a power perspective. So when you are looking at availability options within PowerStore, rest assured that within each individual appliance, there are high availability options for our customers and that is top of mind for us to provide. Digging a little deeper into the connectivity, we have the, what we call the embedded messaging card, which is a four port card. Depending on what the customer's requirements are on a networking perspective, we have options for 25 gigi and 10 gigi, as well as 10 or one G base T per node. Again, duplicate sets of hardware for that. Um, and then for those customers that want even more flexibility or more availability, 
we have options for additional I.O. modules um, that are available per node or SP. And they allow customers to run either, either fiber channel or iSCSI connectivity or and iSCSI connectivity on those um, I.O. modules. Then we also have the, in purple highlighted, we have the management and service ports. And again, these are mirrored from one to another. And then you have your drive expansion ports, which are, again, as you start to scale up and you start to add additional 2U form factor uh, base into PowerStore, you'll be able to connect those to the base enclosure. So from a scale up and scale out perspective, this is a very interesting technology that our customers have seen with some of our previous products in some way, shape or form, right? And I think from a requirements perspective, there is a large customer base that wants to have this federated type of configuration where not only are they able to scale up and add capacity to an existing set of controllers, but also be able to scale out and not just scale out from a performance perspective, scale out also from a management perspective and having that single pane of glass so that from an administrative standpoint, your, your storage administrators or your VMware administrators can manage this as a single entity through what we call Power Store Manager, which is an HTML5 UI that our customers can leverage. Now, one of the things that to me personally, when I first started looking at this slide was, you know, this is interesting. You have an appliance, you, know, you have four appliances in a single cluster, but then why do you have different number of drive configurations or, or you know, drive base inside of each appliance? Because there isn't, the answer is, there really isn't a requirement for our customers to keep a consistent number of base inside of each appliance in the event that our customers have, which most of them do, different applications with different performance requirements, perhaps with higher availability requirements than others, and they wanna be able to manage them all in a single pane of glass, right? So having said that, you know, your Oracle all the way on the, on the left with a PowerStore 5000 model, maybe a fully populated um, appliance with uh, two sets of nodes that, are at, that work in an active, active manner, then to the right, you may have some VMware rich data services. And all the way to the right, you may, you may just need the performance. So we have a PowerStore 9000, our highest end model, with SCN media at the base. So again, one of the things that you'll keep seeing as we go through the content is that the um, flexibility is really there for our customers to take advantage of. We are not really locking our customers into anything in particular. So whether you start small and you scale up, or you start, you know, you start with a few appliances in the cluster, we can provide a very nice configuration for that. Um, another one of my favorite topics is always on inline data reduction. Well, one of the things that really gets talked about a lot between our customers is, you know, we've seen feature proof, not just a data reduction guarantee from Dell, there are, there's competition out there that provides their own version of a data reduction guarantee. But let me explain to you how Dell technology, specifically in PowerStore, is different. Because of the fact that we provide always on inline dedupend compression inside of PowerStore, there is no option for our customers to either turn off or turn this, this feature on. It runs all the time. But in a way, when you look at the architecture, it will run on, on a hardware offloaded technology called Intel uh, Quick Assist technology. So what, what, that will, what, I, what that actually does is it offloads any stress that your controllers it, with other vendors that may be doing it this way that are actually taxing the CPUs or the processors on their controllers to do this activity for them. In our case, we are actually offloading all of that activity away from the processors so that the processors can handle other things like data path, right, and other services. Um, so we are, because of this, we stand behind this four to one data reduction guarantee. And this is what we mean by consistent storage efficiency without compromise. I will break there for a minute. 
we usually get quite a few questions between that content and moving on to the next pillar. Uh, okay, no questions? Okay, continue. So um, as we go on with the content, programmable within the intelligent pillar of power store, there are, there's quite a few things that are very, from an innovational standpoint, is they're, they're very interesting, right? Uh, programmable infrastructure, autonomous appliance and proactive health analytics. Let's go through each one of them and why they would be a good use case for our customers. Going back to the management aspect, administrators, administratively speaking, when you're, when your administrators are working with a storage array, they wanna be able to, number one, generate reports, make sure that they keep tabs on performance as close to real time as possible. And there's a provisioning aspect of this as well, which is essentially, do we provide the end users with capability to do self-service in some way, shape or form? And if not, do we do, it, do, we do this ourselves in an automated fashion in order to cu cut back time? So what we've done with PowerStore is really taking a look at that specific use case. How much can we offload from the administrative team to be able to, be, to, to have these automated tasks run? Now, the number one thing that we're focusing on at launch is provisioning, storage provisioning. Um, if your environment is mainly VMware focused, which for the most part, most of, most of the customers that we see have that configuration, they will have an embedded, um, either through VROPS or VRA, they'll have the ability to provision storage. Um, or if you are already you know, performing some sort of Kubernetes functionality in your teams today, uh, we provide that as well. And Ansible through those playbooks that we can provide um, that is generally available for everyone to, to use. And if um, we have the REST API options as well, for those customers that have used those in the past and are more comfortable with that functionality, uh, we have that option as well. All right, so let's talk about autonomous appliance and, and, and what we mean by that. So there's quite a bit of new terminology that we're using from a Dell Technologies perspective that we think is important to call out. Not only are we able to scale up and scale out as we mentioned before, but a lot of the functionality that's been engineered and has been put together and tested very rigorously is the volume movement from one appliance to another. Whether this is a, an event that our customers are doing preemptively because they need to bring down an, an entire appliance or because they just, they're running out of space and they need to move those volumes over to another appliance. We, have, we actually have this uh, functionality embedded into power store that will alert the customer advising the customer to move a specific volume or volumes from appliance a over to appliance b so here we have a pretty cool visual as to how that works through our machine learning engine which currently runs overseeing every single appliance in the cluster we will have the ability to move those workloads seamlessly from one up from um, from one appliance over to another what this also means from a technical perspective is that a volume will live within an appliance that has an active active node configuration right and because it is belonging to one specific appliance the movement will then get moved over to the other one and then it will be owned by that by that appliance until it is time to either move it back or move it to another appliance um, whatever the customer would like to accomplish with that is what we support. Um, a quick note here on what is being called out on the 99% less fast time to rebalance volumes. We actually use a technology called Dynamic RAID and uh, Dynamic Resiliency Engine that allows for no more are we requiring hot spares in this configuration from a dynamic RAID standpoint, right? And by, by that, we mean that because we are not allotting a hot spare within a rate group, we are actually taking the hot spare data and we're spreading it across up to 25 disks inside of Ray Bay at a time. And because we're taking that, uh, that innovational aspect of rebalancing, your rebalance times are much shorter because only the data that's affected on that one drive that may have a failure would need to be rebalanced uh, therefore after. So 
Um, one quick thing to call out there that we think is pretty neat. As you can see here in the last visual, this is how it would work. Now, interesting fact, when it comes down to a uh, volume movement perspective, when we were doing our beta testing with our beta, with our beta testing customers, we actually um, made this change for them. And uh, the main feedback, feedback was that they really liked that option, but they want to be able to have the last word. So that's why it turned from an actionable item over to a recommended event that lets the customer know, hey, uh, you should probably move this volume over to another appliance as opposed to, let me just move it for you. So uh, that's a very interesting story there from the field as we were testing the product with our customers. Okay, so um, for those of you that are not familiar with Cloud IQ, um, this is a web-based grading system platform that allows our customers to do quite a few things, right? So from a reporting standpoint and grading standpoint, we have Cloud IQ, right? But you can also do a lot of the reporting from Power Store Manager, with, which is embedded. Cloud IQ gives you that and a little bit more, right? And what I mean by that is there's quite a few products from Dell that are supported on Cloud IQ. So you can actually keep tabs on multiple systems, not just Power Store, in your data center. Each individual asset that you have will have its own grading system from a best practices perspective. And you can also see some things like capacity trending um, and you can launch this from your phone. So uh, one more thing about all this is that Cloud IQ is, is included with, uh, with our product. It's free of use for you to leverage as a customer. And then one more thing I'll add, which you know, we like to geek out over here on the, on the uh, SE side of the house, which is if our customers allow it, you can actually provide read-only access to your systems engineers from Dell Technologies to keep tabs on that as well. So um, not only would, will you be informed, but from the account, the local account team will also be informed if you uh, so choose that to be an option. Okay. Um, so good. So far, so good here, guys, with questions. Anything that you may want to tackle before I move on to the last pillar? No question. Okay. All right. So from ad adaptable, flexible architecture, flexible deployment, and flexible consumption. We've talked about the technology behind PowerStore. We've talked about some of the innovation that's been created for this appliance. And now we'll be talking about some of the architecture at a um, deeper level, as well as some of the deployment options and the consumption options, which are very interesting to say the least. Okay. So from a, you know, when we talk about cloud and this is a conversation I'm sure Tim has also had quite a bit with, with his customers, is that for the majority, Customers have, you know, dual data centers or multiple data centers, right? Uh, doing some sort of replication for high availability, or whether it's just a, a, a cold backup site just sitting there waiting to be leveraged. With cloud now in the picture, and because of what's have been happening lately, with um, as far as this year is concerned, which is almost over, um, customers really want to have not just the ability to run workloads on cloud, and, and by saying that, we can mean a lot of things. But because of our tight integration with VMware, we have what we like to call a very straightforward, operationally consistent way to go to a public cloud provider. We have multiple ways to achieve this. And what you're looking at over here, and we're highlighting VMware on AWS, is um, basically running VMs on-prem on PowerStore and then running them on VMware on AWS. And because it's all running on VMware, you'll be able to leverage the same skill set you have in-house today and then use that in order to continue to innovate within your business and provide that value, right? So that's one way to, to achieve that. Second way to achieve that is what we call our cloud storage services. So this is more of a storage specific data replication technology with our partnership that we have with Faction that allows our customers to, to tap into multiple cloud vendors 
not just AWS, um, and being able to seamlessly go from one public cloud to another. So multiple ways to achieve the end goal. And uh, really at the end of the day, one of the things that really captures our customers' attention is, you know, we've been trying to go cloud for the longest amount of time now. Um, it's not as straightforward as we would like for it to be. How do we make this happen sooner than later, right? And, and our answer to that at the moment is through VMware integration. And that's why we're highlighting it here. All right, looks like we have a question. Let's see. Um, numerous servers, daisy chain, then lead to hundreds and fourteen. How is power store different physically? So, great question. Um, we're actually going to go into a uh, a deeper technical insight as as far as how power store um, how power store is architected. But when you're looking at uh, connect, from a connectivity standpoint, and we'll, we'll go over the two options. First option is you have a single power store appliance with up to, um, well, the base enclosure will be the first one, and then three additional DAEs within the same appliance for capacity expansion. And you can leverage that through, again, either iSCSI, which would require some top of rack connectivity, um, or you can do it through fiber channel connectivity um, for that one appliance. Once you start to scale out, you will then have to have top of rack connectivity for intra-cluster communication. So uh, all of that machine learning and volume movement, as well as some of the NAS capabilities require you to have that top of rack network, uh, top of rack network connectivity in place. So that's how that architecture works. Um, from uh, from that perspective, I hope that answers your question. If not, we'll go deeper into it in the next in the in the coming slides. Okay, Let's keep those coming. Okay, so um, from a pay as you grow and a flexible consumption model, we have really three different options right now. Now, I will tell you right off the bat, I am not the financial guy. I'm not the sales guy. I'm the systems engineer. So I'm the technical uh, brains with, uh, behind this thing, but I can tell you based on a high level definition of what each option means. Pay as you grow is really built for those customers that have predictable growth, that know how much they grow year over year, and we give them options to either through a deferred pl a payment plan or other options financially to allow them to buy that um, or that number of different options from a Bell Technologies perspective. Flex on demand is more of a um, commitment based on how much capacity you need and some buffer and some buffer on top that will allow you to scale up and scale down on that capacity and not on that performance that's on the floor. So it's very much OPEX specific. Um, data center utility is a pay per use environment. So we take that even a step further all of which are financed via, via Bell Financial Services. So why are we providing customers with these options? Again, this goes back to the cloud conversation. Some customers are more friendly towards an OPEX, um, maybe where in the past they, they were not, and now they wanna be able to have some additional options, just you know, more than just CapEx. So that's why we came up with these, uh, with, with these different options. All right. Let's talk about some of the architecture behind PowerStore. So we went over the um, some of the dynamic RAID functionality for um, high availability of drives. We went over the high availability from a hardware perspective and how we how we consider that to be highly available. And we talked about data mobility and we talked about cloud. So let's go back for a minute into what we. Uh, proposed from a power store perspective. Now, container-based architecture is the foundation of power store. What we've been able to do is we've been able to containerize and, and or segregate individual components that would, in the past, have all been shared and have all been not segregated. So before containers were available, or even after containers were made available, 
we were providing our customers with an operating system that had access to all of these components on storage, right? But now what we've done is because of this innovation, we are now able to apply specific updates as a use case to an individual component from PowerStore because it's containerized in a Docker container. Because of that, we are allowing our customers to have less downtime. We are allowing our customers to patch as needed um, and more frequently, right? Because if you're affecting less components in your environment, you're probably going to run those updates more than you would in the past. This also enables us as a, as a company, as a provider of technology, to enable future functionality within that container-based architecture and include that into what's already on, deployed on the floor. Very interesting, right? So with that being said, we have two deployments with PowerStore. First one is standard deployment. Your standard deployment is essentially your, your storage made available to external hosts via iSCSI, via fiber channel, right? That we can make available, all within still containing that container-based architecture that runs PowerStore OS. That's what most customers are familiar with. Now, the second one is what we call our hypervisor deployment. Our hypervisor deployment actually has VMware ESXi installed on the controllers, on the array. Now, a lot of the feedback I get, I get on this is, well, wait a minute, you're telling me that you're installing VMware ESXi on the storage array, so I don't need servers anymore? How is this different from that? How is this different from HCI? So many questions. Um, at the end of the day, there's use cases for this, and I will then go back and tell you that um, ultimately, taking a look at the information through data analysis, we can guide our customers down the right path. This will not be the answer for everything, right? Um, and we can definitely recommend where this would make the most sense. What we see the most from a hypervisor deployment option perspective, is that customers will leverage this in their remote offices, so robo sites perhaps, right, where they have small three-tier architectures running VMware already, where they can leverage this in an even denser 2U form factor with PowerStore and run a select number of VMs within that array. That, and being able to manage that appliance in the same fashion that you would manage your standard deployment version of PowerStore in your data center, just imagine the, the ease of use between managing your robo sites with, with this version of PowerStore, the same exact way you manage your PowerStore in your core data center. That's part of the reason why we, we actually went with this. And we call this functionality apps on, by the way. So bringing this to market and our tight integration with VMware, we are now able to provide customers with this option. Going back really quickly to the majority of uh, workload diversity. So I'm actually part of a, an internal engineering group within Dell called Encompass that um, basically takes a look at customer data that's been shared with us. And we looking at, at looking all of all of this all of this information from our customer base, we've been able to see a trend. This trend takes a fully virtualized environment, so number of VMs that we've analyzed. And we've seen that for the majority of the VMs that we've captured, well, they are considered to be general purpose compute intensive, which are not specifically data intensive or storage heavy VMs. So because of that data that we've collected through, you know, through our time and, and running these tools, we can safely say that for those workloads, we can actually pivot to HCI where it would make the most sense for, those, for that VM uh, user profile. So VxRail is our leading HCI option for that. Then you ask, you know, well, that's great, Tomas. Well, what about the other VMs? <laughs> well, the other VMs are what we consider the data intensive. They are, they're, they're not, from a volume, number of VMs perspective, it's less numbers of VMs, but they actually carry the most storage. They're most data intensive workloads. For those, we would recommend a three-tier 
or a power store like deployment of those VMs in a three tier architecture. And then the last, um, I, well, there's one more after this one, but there's there's always going to be some sort of physical server, and you know that that hasn't been virtualized because either the vendor doesn't support it, or you know x amount of reasons why. But at the end of the day, you will have some physical servers that require fiber channel storage or iSCSI storage. So we provide that as well, and we we categorize that as well with an A3 tier architecture design. And then we uh, we do the same for file and object. So having looked at all of these option because Dell Technologies can provide this for our customers. No one else on the market is able to provide this much uh, flexibility within our product set. Um, it's one of the things that we really like to highlight. Uh, and this is all data-driven information, right? This is really is not architecture at all. Taking that point of VMware integration and how we tap into systems, right? Uh, so specifically speaking around VMware, and this is one of the, one of the items that I, I am a very big fan of, being a previous customer and even, and after that being a, a field systems engineer for quite a bit, I can tell you one of the biggest, I, would, I wouldn't say a complaint, I would say you know comments from our customers on the field is, you know, oh, I have to read this host configuration guide. There's host configuration guides for every single storage vendor out there, and each one will have their own specific best practices for configuring, depending on the operating system that you have. So having listened to that comment, we've actually come up with what we call a VMware best practices analyzer. From, because of our plugins, or the AAI and Lawson plugins for ESXi, you are able to not only provision storage uh, and take snapshots from vCenter, but we also provide our customers with the options to uh, run a best practices wizard from a host configuration type perspective. So from within vCenter, you can run a wizard that will tell you what configuration options need to be made on the host for a best practice deployment. You do no longer have to go and read a 100 page document on host configuration guide for space reclaim options or MPIO settings, it's all in there for you to leverage. Um, taking that a step further with Vvault, we have now within PowerStore Manager provided a what we call a watch list. And a watch list can either be something that you highlight as a volume, as a uh, VM, and even as a file system. So you can actually go in and start to create this watch list based on specific VMs, and it will give you VM performance and capacity information that you can turn into, you can then turn into a report and, and share it with the rest of your IT team. So very strong and very consistent, it's a very consistent way for us to uh, provide that integration. And, and actually reach some of those benefits from a customer's perspective, which I think is huge, right? Okay, we're nearing the end here. So anytime upgrade program, um, this is probably outside of a technical view on PowerStore, uh, one of the most important features that we have to give back to our customers. So, with the Anytime Upgrade program, we have three options. Option number one is, I have, I'm a customer, I have purchased a power store unit or appliance, right? As you can see, it has an appliance with two nodes that are inactive active. I now want to leverage a generation two of the same model, you know, sometime after I purchased it. And I wanna do that non-disruptively, and I wanna do that for free, right? So with, the customer's commitment with the Anytime Upgrade program, 180 days after you've purchased the uh, power store appliance, no questions asked, no assessment required, we will swap out the Gen 1 controllers for Gen 2 controllers. That's the first option. The second option that we provide is the higher model option. So let's say that from a performance perspective, you no longer would fit into even a Gen 2 version of 
the PowerStore 1000 model as an example, maybe you need to jump into a PowerStore 3000 model. So we give the customer the option to swap out, not just for, for the next generation, but also a higher model up for more performance. And then the last option is our scale out option, where now we're talking about adding additional controllers uh, in addition to what you already have. So it wouldn't be a swap, it would be a complement of what you already have. And because of that, we would give you credit towards that second deployment in order to get that and achieve that. Very differentiated from what we have out there uh, in the market today from, from some of our competitors. Um, again, we, this is something that we, that we are going at very hard and we commit ourselves to, which is 180 days post-purchase, no questions asked. Here you go, Mr. Customer. Here is the, um, the whichever option that you signed up for, you, you are now entitled to. Okay, so we were getting some questions earlier um, around differences in architecture. I can tell you a lot of our install base, whether it's any of the options you see there at the top, we are making it very simple for our customers to migrate from those technologies over to PowerStore with what we call PowerStore import functionality. And um, because that is native to each appliance, it is a wizard driven uh, activity that the administrator will run from PowerStore and move over workloads from one of, the, from one of those appliances at the top over to the PowerStore at the bottom. So now that we've talked about the three pillars, we've talked about use cases for each, we've talked about cloud connectivity, architecture, why architecture matters, because this is an active-active controller architecture, um, just like it has been in the past with most of our products. And some key differentiating aspects, like how we handle um, hot spares now with dynamic RAID, how we handle it via dynamic resiliency engine, and how we do hardware offloading of compression just to call out a few differentiating factors as to why PowerShell would make sense for most customers. Four to one data reduction because of what I just mentioned. And your flexible um, deployment options as well as consumption. And that uh, wraps up. I know we're uh, nine minutes out. I wanted to leave some time for some open questions from anybody out there. Anything that Anybody would like to touch upon that maybe we didn't go into detail as far as uh, you know, data protection is concerned or high availability or NAS functionality, anything like that? Well, Tomas, I know we don't have many questions coming in, but I wanted to go ahead and, and let the audience kind of hear some of the questions that we get in the field so that if, if maybe they'll think of these questions, we can go ahead and kind of answer them ahead of time for them. So if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and ask a couple of these, you know, that we've, we've, we've heard, and this may help gain some view of what our, what our customers may be asking. So oh, Tim, the I, do wanna, I do, sorry to interrupt you. I do want to make sure that when people see, I'm about to drop the last poll, just so we can gauge people as far as um, if they want a, a more detailed follow-up. So while you're going over questions and while they're asking questions, I'm going to go ahead and drop this last poll. So if it gets stuck, it's not that, it's not that big of a deal. It's the end. I do want to encourage people to keep asking questions and participate in this poll too. Perfect, perfect. So like one it. of the questions I get a lot in the field for PowerStore is, is that over to the presentation we've mentioned that the PowerStore, we can install 10 gig and 25 gig Ethernet ports, and we can also install eight, 16, 32 gig fiber ch channel cards. But can we, can the PowerStore deliver that storage using both fiber channel and iSCSI simultaneously in case we want to swap technologies or we want to migrate multiple workloads toward the power store? Great question. So short answer is yes, we do support both options uh, from a flexibility standpoint. There are reasons behind why we would have iSCSI more than fiber channel. So we lead with that, right? Uh, for, for, the most, for the most part, what we've seen is most customers leveraging iSCSI, believe it or not. Um, the reason why we added fiber channel is because we do have a, a fairly large still customer base that has fiber channel connectivity in their data center. Um, 
but from a from a storage migration standpoint, it would be an ice custody connection. So power store power store import functionality would require that. And uh, for external host connectivity for for fiber channel purposes, we do have uh, multiple I/O modules that can support that as well. So either or, or both, it works. Okay. So another question I get a lot in the field is, if we use the NAS feature on the Power Store to possibly replace Windows file servers to reduce our complexity, do we need to log into Power Store Manager to manage the permissions in the folders, or can we just do that through Windows Explorer or other native admin tools that we currently use today? Excellent question. Um, you, so the creation of the NAS servers would be done from Power Store Manager, but everything else, um, even like going back to previous versions of files, like uh, shadow copies of older files that you're used to doing through Windows Explorer would stay the same. So you would manage it the exact same way you do today uh, from a permission standpoint. When you configure the NAS servers for those file systems, you would specify which protocols, in this case, SMB, and you can have LDAP integration for those NAS services. So integrating permissions for uh, groups and or users is fully supported, and you could manage that outside of PowerStore. Perfect. And what, uh, one of the big questions I get, and um, I'm actually listening for a great answer this as well, Tomas, so apologies on the difficulty, but I've gotten a lot of customers asking me that we are a Hyper-V shop. Can we still use PowerStore and benefit from a lot of the features? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, that, that's a good call out because um, a lot of our messaging and a lot of our content is centered around VMware. Um, as you can imagine, with anything that goes to market, it's based on uh, user adoption, right? We, we just tend to see more VMware use cases. That's why we have tighter integration and those feature sets. But it's not, it's not an all or nothing. It's not that you'd get very limited uh, functionality the hardware um, offload perspective, anything that has to do with volume migrations, MPIO settings for high availability for PowerStore, the container-based architecture, all of those features, regardless of which operating system you're running, would still be there, would still be supported. So from a Hyper-V perspective, sure, you may not get that best practices uh, wizard that I love to call out as, as much as I can, but you do get everything else that PowerStore provides. Excellent, so on that same topic, if, if we decide to replatform in the future, let's say we're currently VMware shop, we're currently Hyper-V shop, and we're looking to maybe swap over to, you know, to from, from VMware to Hyper-V or vice versa, we can still use the array for both environments. Absolutely. Perfect, and here's one technical question that I get a lot. And this is, this is based on your, on your diagrams. In the PowerStore images we looked at earlier, where we showed the actual hardware, I noticed that there is, each controller appears to only have one power connection. If we lose one of those power connections, do we lose the controllers associated with it as well, or do both nope. controllers stay online? So, excellent question, I love this. Um, this. So, specifically from a power supply perspective, each power supply is, has been built in order to sustain power to both controllers. In the event you lose one PSU, the other PSU will sustain both controllers up time. Excellent. So that's kind of, the, that's, that's most of the questions I get from the customer perspective. Does anybody else, any of the, the attendees want to post any questions in the, in the list we can go over? Awesome. Well, I, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining. Uh, we really like to tell the Power Store story and, and how it may benefit our customers. Um, I will now hand it back to Lindsay. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining and hanging um, there with us through the technical difficulties. There, This was recorded, so we'll send that out to attendees uh, in the next couple of days. And as mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we'll be 
uh, going through the list of people who registered and we will randomly draw a winner for the gift card and that person will be emailed. So thanks again, everybody. And enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.
a winner for the gift card and that person will be emailed. So thanks again, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.